you didn't turn out one Saturday for the killing of your co-religionists by Bashar al-Assad. You didn't spend one weekend outside the Chinese embassy for the putting into concentration camps of one million Muslims in China. You didn't turn out in massacre after massacre, in country after country. But this country, Israel, does one thing, never mind a war, one thing, and the streets erupt. Why? Shalom and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. There's a campaign of violent intimidation afoot to try to make it impossible to speak up for Israel. All around the world, on streets and campuses and social media, Israel is being demonized, and Jews and Israelis dehumanized. Anyone who speaks up for Israel comes under a torrent of abuse and even death threats. Speaking up for Israel takes thick skin, but as I said at a rally in London marking a hundred days of this war, people respect you when you stand up for yourself, when you stand up to the bullies. If anyone knows what it means to stand up to bullies and what the violent anti-Israel movement means for cities like London, it's today's guest, the dashingly debonair Douglas Murray. Douglas is the number one best-selling author of seven books, including The War on the West. He's also an associate editor of The Spectator. Since October 7th, he's basically decamped to Israel to report on this war and to share stories and perspectives that tell a different side from what much of the media is showing. Brutally honest and fearless, Douglas stands up to the haters, staking out a leading reputation as an unapologetic ally of the Jews and a vocal advocate for Israel. Douglas joins me here for a fireside chat about what the West gets wrong and where it's going wrong. How Israel, in fact, embodies values that he wants to see his own native England live up to with his trademark wit and wry panache, will navigate anti-Semitism, media bias, and what it means to stand up to bullies. Because at stake is not only the state of our nation, it's the state of the West. On with the show. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when a four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't why is this crisis. Douglas Murray, welcome to the State of a Nation. Great to be with you. Tell me, when you were growing up in England, going to school at Eton with the three-piece suit, correct? And tails, four-piece four yeah. suit, <laughs> because including the top hat uh, and the cane. Did, they just dropped the top they hat. They just dropped, but you had a top hat. Well, I, I can't go into my wardrobe. And a cane, was there a cane? Um, no, no, canes were dropped then. Uh, but yeah, morning dress. So morning dress. Morning dress. Did you have a hero of the Jewish people on your list of things to be when you grew up? <laughs> Um, no, I don't really think I knew what I was going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, you make choices in life and uh, stand up for the things you want to stand up for and you end up where you are. Is that a description you would agree with now? Uh, that the, the war has catapulted you to that no, position of no. hero of the Jewish people? No, there are many heroes of Jewish people. I'm, I, all I do is write and speak. Do you understand why some people see you, for them, as being the breakout star, if you will? of the war who is a hero in some respects. I just don't like the word hero. I don't think writers should use those sort of terms. All the professions, all of the things which actually require real heroism, firefighters, soldiers, you know, policemen, they don't have endless backslapping about their heroism. So I always find it too much when writers do. Even worse when actors do, by the way. Because even, when, even when it does require a certain amount of courage to speak out on an issue that many people are afraid to make their voices Well, heard. all you have to do is just not listen to uh, maniacs. <laughs> Which is good advice. The no. problem is many of the maniacs are dangerous. Sure. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast and have this conversation is that you straddle a very interesting line since the October 7 massacre. You're a journalist. It is your job to report. You've interviewed the Prime Minister as well. But at the same time as a journalist, you're choosing to cover stories that the rest of the media isn't covering, to focus on certain issues like the Palestinian authorities, pay for slay scheme mm -hmm. that other media are overlooking to bring voices that others aren't looking at. And so many people see you as in some ways, not only a reporter who's covering Israel, but in some ways, our voice 
or one of our voices in the world. Does that sound accurate or fair to you? I mean, I, I, I only have my own voice um, and all I can do is to tell the truth as I see it. I'm very, very pleased when that coincides with other people's you know, opinions. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly alarmed to tell the truth. Um, I'm very pleased when I hear the reception I have in Israel and from Jewish communities around the world. Um, but it also slightly saddens me, and that's because it sort of seems to me that people feel that they don't have very many allies. That's true. And if it is the case, it's extremely worrying as well as sad. And if it isn't the case, it's just sad that people feel so alone, or at least how few non-Jews speak up. Um, and uh, so it's both, you know, enormously humbling and rewarding, but also, I think, saddening to me. Because, I, I mean, why wouldn't, I mean, why should Jews be surprised that somebody who's not Jewish sees their point of view? It shouldn't be that rare. It shouldn't be that rare. I mean, I mean by comparison, think of the number of people who hadn't heard of the Houthis until about 10 days ago, and are already way bang on the side, you know, love the Houthis, couldn't really, I couldn't find Yemen on a map and so on, but they really have taken that side. And people aren't that surprised by that, by comparison. It seems to be surprising if somebody's on the side of Israel. And that's really astonishing because, you know, over the last year in Israel, we had a year of very difficult political polarization. Yeah, I heard about that. The whole country had gone mad. Mm. And then suddenly October 7 happened and we saw people covering up, denying Hamas's atrocities, mm. now in many cases, including senior UN officials, mm. or in fact, the whole UN mechanism, intervening to try to save Hamas's skin in the wake of the mm. massacre, and it feels that the whole world has gone mad. Does it look that way to you? Well, I think the world's been mad for years. Maybe it always, <laughs> maybe it always was. Um, maybe it always was like that. I mean, I've, I said during the COVID era to various friends and colleagues, I said, there's one job in this era which don't go mad. And that sounds like quite a simple demand. Turns out to be much more difficult Why than so? I expected. Well, because people derange themselves. We, we live in an era where there's, uh, we, have, we all have a device in our pockets that gives us a bewildering amount of information, too much for the human brain, coming in too fast. The treadmill is going faster than our feet can go, and it deranges a lot of people that just fall off and fall into catastrophe. But, I mean, it's not just a question of derangement and people getting distracted by whatever social media is sending them, but there seems to be some sort of episode happening. Hmm. in the West right now, the mass protest that we are seeing against Israel in favor of the Houthis, even as they fire at British mm -hmm. targets and British ships, this total mobilization of parts of society against mm. Israel that lead many people in Israel and around the Jewish world to see it as profoundly anti-Semitic and Which not just is. a question of um, anti-Israel. And, and that's because what many people see is that anti-Semitism has historically been a tool through which failing societies or societies that seek to deflect from their own mm -hmm. failures, then mobilize themselves around this total ideology mm. of opposition yeah. to the Jews. And that's how we find that even within the protests around the world, we have a clip here from one of the climate protests that Israel seems to play a role in all these other different causes. Well, yes, in which because, it because has nothing that it's one, related but to. It right. does have something to do with it because I mean, several reasons. One is the thing you say about uh, the, the, the nature of anti-Semitism and societies that latch onto it. We all know that it's a very, very bad sign when a society lurches towards anti-Semitism for lots of reasons. One of them is for the society itself. It suggests that the society is dissolving and degrading into a feverish place. Um, Vasily Grossman, one of my favorite writers, writes in the middle of Life and Fate, his great epic of the 20th century, that, um, that on his three pages in the center of that 900 page masterpiece, he says, um, tell me what you accuse the Jews of, I'll tell you what you're guilty of. Um, absolutely true, absolutely true. And well, how is that playing, it, how's that playing out now, do you see? Well, I mean, f for a lot of people, it's working as, um, no, the people you mentioned, like the, why are the climate people? Well, let's have a look. We okay, actually have yeah, a little yeah. clip from uh, Greta Thunberg, who's uh, ah, become yes. one of the major Hamas fangirls recently. <laughs> No climate justice, no climate justice on, occupied, on land. occupied land. No climate justice on occupied land. 
I mean, what are they t- what are they talking about? How has the question of Israel come to claim such a massive role in these people's psyche that it defines not only how they see the Middle East but informs how they view every other struggle in the world? Well, one thing is uh, era of profound stupidity, um, in which, as I've said for many years, the adults have left the room. An example of the adults leaving the room is the idea that uh, a truant schoolgirl from Sweden should dictate global climate policy. Never seemed to me a good idea. Always seemed to me she should spend more time in school. And the fact that so many politicians bowed to her views on, I mean, I said when she first emerged, um, people didn't like to criticize her when she first emerged because they said, well, here's a schoolgirl who's autistic. I dare you to criticize her, I dare you. And I remember saying when she first emerged, like, what is this game? If I found a younger person who was more autistic and adored fossil fuels, and I put that person out there, would I win? (laughs) Okay, it it was always a trap, the Greta Thunberg thing, always a trap. Now she's of age, she's she's an adult, so it's easier to criticize her, it should be. Um, It's always been a bad sign when things like that happen. And yet I feel that it goes deeper than well, it does, but saying but, the world has always been no, mad, no, 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 the world but, has always been stupid. Something is happening no, no, no. now. But a very specific thing. There are times, if, if, if you read an account of some, if a time in the Middle Ages where a, a young girl with blazing eyes came from a neighboring village and told you all you were going to burn. You go, well, I mean, that, that's a strange sort of thing to happen. Well, here we are in the 21st century with exactly the same phenomenon. It's a very odd thing, this whole devolving of expertise um, and, 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 and what these people end up with. They, they're, the, the one, there's an analogy from Japanese culture, which is that if you're a warrior for a, um, a, a great leader in medieval Japan, um, and if your leader died, you would wander around the land looking for another person to affix your loyalty to. Yeah, that's what these people are. They, 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 believe, uh, they believe the earth is burning, uh, uh, climate emergency, climate emergency, uh, Palestinian emergency, this emergency. They're desperately, desperately searching for things to attach their, 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 themselves to. And there's another point on this, which is that these people are doing um, politics by just every issue. You can always tell somebody hasn't thought deeply about anything when they have completely predictable views on every single issue. If you'd have asked me five years ago, how do you think Greta Thunberg will end up on the Palestinian question? I'd have said, she'll end up exactly like that because she'll get her politics a la carte. The the fact that Israel has become this bugbear issue and part of the basket of what it means to be on the left, I understand. What I don't understand is the obsessive role that it seems to play within the Western imagination and among these people and how it has become this organizing principle, if you will, of large parts of society. And and I'm asking this because as I try as a spokesman to try to speak to foreign media and to try to influence public opinion, I'm simply at a loss to try to understand what this, uh, pardon me, psychotic moment is that seems to have overtaken such large parts of the Western world. Well, you can tell one thing by the manner of communication. And this is, if I can say so, quite an important point. That manner of communication betrays something very interesting. That isn't argument, is it? What they're doing? No. Right. What is it? It's very performative. It's performative. What else? It's performative. It seems impulsive, emotional. It seems to come from the gut. I would say, it it certainly doesn't come from the brain, Um, it's, uh, it's a different form of communication from, for instance, the one we're having at the moment we are in, involved in a dialogue right now. And that's what most people I know, certainly everyone I respect, is able to engage in. If I just sat here and said, cease fire now, or whatever, just over and over again, you say, yeah, you said it once, I got it. Why do these people think if they keep bludgeoning people with their stupid, predictable, ill-informed opinions, that we're going to suddenly say, ah, now I get it, we should have a ceasefire or whatever it is. I think they're trying to apply political pressure. And if you put enough pressure and mobilize enough people, then that's how change is made. That's what they think. That's what they think. And they may be right. They may be right. 
that they may be right that people can be influenced by that form of communication. I personally think it's the worst possible form of communication because I don't think it is communication. It is a, a bludgeoning of people with very, of people by people who have a very, very limited understanding of these things. And that is, by the way, one other giveaway of it. If they understood anything about this, you wouldn't just keep saying the same thing over and over. You wouldn't decide every Saturday to just chant the same banality. If The reason they do it is because if you go underneath it, as you and I know from the people who go through the protests and ask any follow-on question, none of the marchers, almost none, would be able to answer a follow-on question. So they stick with the boring, ill-informed mantra and they hope that they will persuade us by it. And I hope that it doesn't work. By the way, I think if that's anything, it's a silver lining that when you see people on the West chanting intifada, intifada, and everyone gets stressed saying these people are calling for suicide bombings on public transport, because that's what the intifada was in Israel. Yeah. Actually, the fact that they don't know what an intifada is, right. and they're operating out of, out of ignorance rather well, than that's, malice, that's, is comforting. Yeah, perhaps. absolutely. I mean, that, that is a striking thing as well. I mean, if I was to spend my Saturday chanting for something, I'd like to think that I'd know what the word meant. Like you'd think that would be a, a starting place. I mean, you get these people, who, they, they, they have their banners and then, you know, somebody says, uh, well, you know, what does the thing on your banner mean? And, oh, I don't know. Somebody just gave it to me. Like, what, what kind of moron are you? I, would you or I spend our time walking around with banners some other guy we've never met gave us? Why? What's wrong with you people? So I want to pick your brains about a segment of public opinion in the West that I think actually do know what they're talking about. And, and that is actually the large... Um, not a majority, but certainly noticeable, Jewish mobilization against Israel among elements of the ultra-progressive left-wing uh, well, Jewish they're, public they're, they're, they're totally unimportant. Why do you think they're unimportant? Well, because everyone knows they're maniacs. I mean, they're, they're, it's like uh, queers for Palestine. It's just like, okay, you know, chickens for KFC, all that kind of stuff. These people are so clearly deluded. The, the people who are doing uh, Jews for Palestine at the moment are the same th the people who did uh, Kaddish for Hamas in Parliament Square a few years ago. Remember that? We have a little clip, actually, from ah. the recent protests. Let's um, watch and see. On the steps of the Foreign Office here in London. Yeah, they're chanting, not in our name. They're marching for a ceasefire. And we see them now, again, you were saying, talking about performative theater. Here they are wearing all the Jewish religious garments, the talit, the tefillin, blowing the shofar. The uh, COVID masks are not traditional uh, uh, Jewish garments, but they've made their way into, into here I, as well. The, the, uh, I like the green haired one. The, the, that's, yes. uh, that's definitely not a lunatic. A regular occurrence. Yeah. I, yeah. And I wonder, I mean, these people, I think do know what they are talking about. They're not completely ignorant. So what is motivating them to mobilize against Israel? When someone like you, who is not Jewish, comes from the outside, does see our side of the story? Well, um, look, every community has its lunatics. I mean, I mentioned Queers for Palestine. I've been saying for a while that Queers for Palestine are just the gay Naturi Carter. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, every, every community has uh, people for suicide. Okay, fine, you die. Uh, can't take anyone else with you. Uh, so, so yeah, everybody has those people. As for uh, the specific thing of some of the Jews, look, you can be an anti-Zionist Jew. I mean, there are plenty of people and always have been historically who have been. Um, I mean, if you read Weizmann's memoirs, uh, the, 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 the board of deputies in England at the time of the foundation of this state were opposed, of course, to the foundation of the state. And very wisely came around. A bit. No, they have, they have, they have. Uh, I, well, the board of deputies is not known for its uh, strength on the question of Israel. But anyway, the point is, is simply that there is a, tra a trail, there is a, there is a trail of, 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 um, skepticism on, on this in the diaspora, let's say. Uh, okay, some of that's understandable. Certainly it was understandable in the past. I don't think it's pretty understandable now, but okay. You do not have to go from I'm a Jew who isn't a Zionist to I'm a Jew who says morning prayers for Hamas. Like that, that's the point when you turn into psychosis. These, these are sick, sick people. And uh, fine, we've had them always historically. You know, the, uh, the, every Jew knows that there have been bad Jews. 
it's not um, uh, it, it, it's not a surprise to me. Every community has bad people in it, and evil people, and people who wish the rest of the community very, very significant harm. And um, which, is, which is disturbing analysis because these people, I'm sure, would also push back and say that they believe they are acting out of the noblest values. They believe they well, are doing good. No one ever says good. that I know I'm acting from evil. I mean, you have to believe you think you're doing good in order to do something wicked, um, as well as to do something good. No, I, I mean, these, um, I, I don't find these Jewish fringe, fringe figures of any significance. I think there are two groups in the West who are significant. I think that there is the green bit of the Green Red Alliance, what we saw there. Uh, which, the climate movement. No, not just the climate movement. There's the leftist movement. Okay. Um, the ones who, yeah, again, they, they get their politics off the shelf. You can predict 100% certainty what the sort of things they'll say before they say them. And on the question of the Middle East, they will think it's all about the Palestinians, two states or whatever. Um, th those people are a fringe in politics in every country who always have a risk, as with the Democrats in America, of becoming slightly more mainstream. That's the first part of the anti-Israel movement in the West. The second, and the much more worrying to my mind, and the much more difficult to talk about for most people, is the Muslim anti-Semitism, which is very, very hard for Jews or non-Jews to identify. But it's without question the main driver now. The marches, the video you saw, videos we just saw weren't very representative of them, but the marches in London are mainly Muslim. They are Pakistani Muslims and others who arrived in Britain in recent generations and brought the anti-Semitism of their homeland with them. Are they still really mainly Muslim marches or are you not seeing a lot of white Britons as no, well? You're seeing a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing a lot. But the driver, the driver is undoubtedly Muslim communities in the UK, Muslim communities in Paris who want to protest there. Um, it's different in different countries, but that's the main driver. And uh, a very close enemy of mine, Mehdi Hassan, some years ago said in an article something true. And that's why I remember it. Yes, I remember. He received a lot of pushback for this. Yeah, of course he would, because his, his audience expect lies. Um, but he said in this article about 10 years ago, he said, uh, he said the Muslim community in Britain, uh, it, it, he said, anti-Semitism is our dirty little secret. He said, it's our dirty I little secret. This. He said, it, every Muslim reading this will know what I mean. It's always there at the dinner table. It's always there around the table. Now, I, I, which was an uh, astonishing moment of honesty to, to, to yes, credit. Yes, yes. No, Hassan. I mean, I, I, as I say, I credit him for telling the truth for once. But he, um, but he's uh, in this in this revelation he made, he confirmed something I've said for years. Um, I mean, for instance, um, if you import a lot of people from I don't know a philo-Semitic background, maybe you'd have a more philo-Semitic society. Not that it's a term I particularly like, but. If you import a lot of people from an anti-Semitic background, you'll have a lot more anti-Semites in your society. Mm. Um, Germany, after the war, decided to import a lot of people from Turkey and the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And Germany, as a result, which wasn't a country that needed a lot more anti-Semites, has got a lot more anti-Semites. And they are trying to work out what to do about that. And it's not easy because these people are citizens. Um, in Britain, we have... Hamas leaders who live freely in Britain have been given British citizenship by the British state and they plot evil and violence against the people of this country. Now, the British government, Labour and Conservative, seems to not know what to do about that, and that's Hamas leaders. So imagine how much more worrying it is for the, for the country when they see hundreds of thousands of relatively recent migrants of Muslim background who... And this is the other thing. They ask, why are they so feverish? Why are they so feverish about Israel? Um, I did a very unpleasant sum some years ago, a few years into the Syrian civil war, which was, if you add up all of the people killed on both sides of every conflict involving Israel from 1948, including the War of Independence, right up to the present, and you include the highest estimated death tolls on not just the side of Israel, but on the side of Egypt, Jordan, everyone else, you get an average six months killing in Syria over the last decade. Astonishing. Right. So why would it be that if you are a Pakistani Muslim in London, you 
didn't turn out one Saturday for the killing of your co-religionists by Bashar al-Assad. You didn't spend one weekend outside the Chinese embassy for the putting into concentration camps of one million Muslims in China. You didn't turn out in massacre after massacre, in country after country. But this country, Israel, does one thing, never mind a war, one thing, and the streets erupt. Why? Muslim anti-Semitism is one of the variants of anti-Semitism and is the most prevalent and pushing in our time. And it terrifies the leaders of Western democracies because they have brought this into the West and they don't know what to do about it. I can understand to some extent Muslim anti-Semitism that will have come from other countries and, as you say, been imported into Western countries. What I find more difficult to understand is the way that the anti-Israel cause seems to have captured the imagination mm. of so many white Britons, people from a Christian or atheist background, mm. uh, not from a Muslim background. Why does Israel seem to have this hold on the especially young imagination in the West. I mean, what is rotten with the youth that you end up with polls saying that in America, 50% of youth support Hamas? What does that say about the state of these societies and the broader issues that, that need to be addressed? Well, one thing is, let me give you a stat that's a little connected to that. Um, in New York State, which pays roughly the most of any state, I think, in the union, uh, in terms of school fees, it's about, it, what's only during the COVID period, it's about $30,000 a year per pupil for, for state schooling. Um, that's a lot of money. You should be able to do quite a lot with that. Uh, in New York State, the uh, um, K through 12, uh, the children who come out with a basic standard of literacy is 50%. Basic literacy, 50%. Basic literacy, K through 12. Basic numeracy, I think, is 52%. So, these figures might all be related. We're talking about people who can't read and can't add up. You could diddle them out of the, their change at the cash till and they wouldn't know. So, I wouldn't go to those people for solving one of the most intractable problems in global affairs. But it might be connected it might be connected. If you are so incapable of basic attainment in education, you are this ignorant, you are this ignorant, maybe you are particularly vulnerable to people who come along and say, there's this problem, and if we shout boring slogans often enough and we shout at people in the street and we do this, we could solve this problem, why don't you join? I'm saying it's a d demonstration of educational failure of an astonishing kind and a moral failure at the heart of America and, and of Britain, that there have not been enough adults who have corrected them and in fact just informed them. I mean, don't, don't, there's one other point I must make on this. Don't forget that all, all of our lives, you're a bit younger than me, but all of our lives, every politician in the West from both political sides said the same thing. They said that the solution to all of the Middle East's problems was the creation of a Palestinian state. They said that. Didn't matter if it was David Cameron or Ed Miliband. It's the foreign policy it's orthodoxy that foreign policy. astonishingly hasn't shifted with the October 7th. It massacre. hasn't shifted. Amazingly enough, uh, these people are still saying this. And it should by now be demonstrable, not just the Palestinians were already given a state in 2005 and created a terrorist state. In Gaza, of course. In Gaza. So, I mean, I, I'm not, don't see why they should be given another go and another go and another go, particularly not after October 7th. I don't see why you should reward the terrorism of that day by doubling down on the two-state solution. But when you, when you look at that analysis that we were told all the time growing up, the orthodoxy, if the Palestinians can only get a state and live happily side by side with the, by the Israelis. You know, the economy of Yemen will blossom. Uh, the, the, the ayatollahs in Iran will realize that women aren't dirt um, and, and so on. No, of course not. It doesn't have any impact on any of the problems of the region. You, th you think that North Africa is going to get sorted out or anything? 
just because there's another failed Arab state? Of course not. But that has dissolved in front of our eyes. It has been as proven to be wrong as anything can be proven to be wrong in international relations. And yet they still say it. They still say it, and, and you've spoken that you think it's a question of stupidity, of illiteracy, of innumeracy, but whatever the reasons are, one of the things that I've been trying to talk about in the course of this war, trying to draw people's attention to what monstrosity this is that has grown up under their noses of this violent anti-Israel movement, mm. is that they're not only coming after Israel, they are a threat to the well-being of your free, liberal, democratic societies yes. as well. When Mike Freer, the member of parliament for Finchley, has to step down because the Islamist threats are too much, when there is a cinema mm. owner in Barcelona who refuses to host Israeli movies because his family have been getting death threats. When you mm. have to change venue for a talk in London because the mm. theater decides to cancel you, this violent anti-Israel movement is trying to dictate to Western countries, to non-Jews as well, mm -hmm. what they can say, who they can listen to, what they can do. And I'm wondering, do you see the beginning of a pushback against this well i'm certainly not doing what they want me to do and thank goodness you're not but well, and i never but will. are you a lone voice in the wilderness or no, do you not see at others all. waking not up at all. To... i have enormous uh, um, uh, support and, and uh, much more in the uk and in the us and elsewhere I, i'm not a minority i'm not a minority in my own country um i won't be bullied or pushed around by some islamist blowhard loud mouths of course not I'm rather shocked, by the way. I mean, the, the, the Mike Freer case, there's two shocking things about it. One is that he was put into a position where he felt he had to step down. And the other is, is that uh, there was so little, uh, relatively little horror in the British media or political class that this had happened. I would say that if, a, if, a, if an MP had to stand down from Parliament because of threats from far-right white supremacists who have no meaningful role in Britain, then, then I, mean, I mean, if that did happen, the whole country would be united in saying, how dare they do this? And what's more, would have protected the MP. The acceptance of the fact that Islamist uh, um, threat exists in our society and that we might have to give in to it horrifies me. And uh, I've, I said, I mean, I, I, look, everyone has to make their own decisions, but I'm horrified by what Mike Freer decided to do and the manner in which he decided to do it. Um, he has to make his own decisions about his life, but I would prefer the Conservative Party of Margaret Thatcher, for instance. The day after the Brighton bombing, which very nearly killed Margaret Thatcher and her husband, that was de intended to kill Margaret Thatcher and her husband, and killed her friend, uh, killed a number of her colleagues, and very, very badly wounded others in the Brighton Hotel bombing. She stepped out the next morning. The Conservative Party conference went on. She said, we do not give in to the men of violence. We do not give in to terrorism. The party conference will go on as normal. Now, that's the Britain I know. Stiff upper lip, chin up. Uh, more than that, tough, resilient. Don't give in to bullies. You don't give in to violence. You don't give in to terrorists. Never, never. The idea that we've slipped so so quietly and so relatively easily into this pacified people who can be pushed around by people who have no right to push us around is an outrage to me. And by the way, it's a darn fool position to find yourself to, in to stand up for a man more than he's willing to stand up for himself. So I should just stress that Mike Freer in an interview the week after he had to stand down from Parliament said to an interviewer who asked him about the Islamist Ali Harbi Ali, who murdered Sir David Amos um, in his constituency surgery three years ago. Sir David was killed by a jihadist who was also apparently scouting out David Amos's house and the house of another MP friend of mine. Um, Mike Freer's house, you mean? Mike Freer and, uh, and Michael Gove was also one of the targets. Mm. Um, uh, now, Mike Freer was asked in an interview after he said he was going to step down because of threats by an interviewer, what was, the, what was it that motivated Sir David Amos's murderer? And do you know what Mike Freer said? No. I don't know. Because he's being silenced. Right. Here's the thing. I have a lot of contempt for that. I think that's a contemptuous position to be in.
contemptuous but difficult to no, look, judge someone who's coming under threats like I, that. Look, yeah, well, a lot of people come under threats and the threats get worse when the threats work. And I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that I've been wondering about is, as I'm I should trying have to said contemptible, to, not contemptuous. Contemptible. It's contemptible. Contemptible. I think, I think I was so filled with contempt, I forgot the appropriate word. I think we've had a good run of the English language in the podcast so far, yeah. but one little slip up is acceptable. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this because one of the things I'm wondering about when thinking about how we speak to foreign audiences in the UK, around the world, is there does seem to be a very large gulf in values between what is obvious and consensual within Israeli society and the way that Western societies see themselves. Western mm. societies that have enjoyed a long peace mm -hmm. since 1945, a long peace, by the way, secured through total victory over the enemy and mm -hmm. uh, means that would now be considered... At whatever uh, the cost. At whatever the cost. Although I don't think that's a very useful phrase in the recent context. I prefer to say uh, at zero cost if Hamas surrenders and otherwise mm -hmm. at minimum possible cost. But mm -hmm. I want to bring up a poll that I saw recently that uh, really disturbed me from YouGov that asked uh, young uh, British people under the age of 40, mm -hmm. 18 to 40, yeah. if a new world war broke out, which of the following would you do? Only 7% said that they would volunteer for military service. 21% they said they would not volunteer but would serve if called up. And an astonishing 38% said they would not volunteer and would refuse to serve if called up. 17% don't know. Another 17% think that they'd be given some sort of disability By exemption. the way, that, that, they're a fascinating group, that last one. I don't believe the armed forces would want me to serve due to age or disability. Now, saying it's all 18 to 40 year olds. Correct. Why do they think that if they're 18 to 40, that they wouldn't be allowed to serve due to their age? This is a group that didn't understand the question. <laughs> okay, so first of all, we've got a lot of adults and uh, or a lot of people who would fake being ill. Okay, that's not a very good statistic. The numbers change yeah. only slightly if you ask, if Britain were at risk of imminent invasion, hmm. would you sign up? And still you have a very large minority that says it would refuse to serve even if the country were invaded, which to Israelis would be absolutely bonkers because on the 7th of October anyone who had a weapon and could go down to the kibbutzim and defend them or join the military get called up for reserves um, at least outside the the Arab and ultra orthodox communities although there too and among the ultra orthodox we're mm, seeing an uptick in absolutely. people enlisting it was just so obvious that you have to defend your borders you have to defend your home mm -hmm. through force if necessary and we don't want to have to do this but if we have to we will and that message mm from the polling numbers that I'm seeing in the West doesn't seem to cut through because you have such large numbers in the West who wouldn't physically defend their homes, even if they had to. Well, the first thing is to say it wasn't as clear as it is now on October the 6th um, in Israel. Uh, um, Brothers in Arms and various groups um, uh, got the security analysis in this country very badly wrong. As you know, there's an interview with four. You're former... saying with the threats that they wouldn't serve. Well, I mean, you had you had uh, um, soldiers and commanders saying that they would not serve in, in in conflict. I thought that was absolutely unbelievable. Of course, when the massacre happened, they dropped everything and went right, straight into action. Right, which is a point we need to come back to. But just on this point of the definition of what was happening, very distinguished uh, uh, sons of this country, uh, like um, uh, Bougie Alon interviewed on Israeli television, four of them on one, one interview, uh, then they say that, the, uh, that there is no existential threat to Israel from Hamas and that Benjamin Netanyahu is a bigger threat than Hamas. And if one thing is clear since October 7th, it's that we as a country dramatically underestimated the level of the threat and how and, dangerous and things that's could in get. A, that's in a country which knows the threat, that knows the threat and has lived the threat in recent generations. So, of course, how much worse is it in countries that haven't known war for generations? And do you think that's part of the reason that we as Israel are clearly struggling to cut through in a public opinion yes. in the West? Yes, because... I mean, why, why <laughs> in a, a word, is it so difficult for us to cut through? Because the West believes that peace is the human norm, inheritance and right. It's a human right to live in peace. It isn't. Isn't it? There is no such right. No such right exists in nature. 
it would it is a wonderful thing to have but it can be taken away like all rights it's the problem of the language of rights the language of rights is taught as if rights exist like oxygen and they don't they only exist if they are fought for and maintained and they can only be maintained if people who would threaten your rights including your most basic rights like your right to life are not allowed to succeed there is no law of nature that makes peace the norm it isn't the norm historically. We are deeply blessed to have lived in the past few generations in a world in which it was relatively the norm in Western democracies. Thanks to total victory in Thanks to total victory in 1945 and then again in 1989-1990. And seeing off the two twin horrors of the 20th century of fascism and communism. But it is not the norm. But if you grew up in the post-war dividend, the post-Cold War dividend, you could easily come out with the misunderstanding that this was the normal state of human affairs. It isn't. I did have a thought after the Ukraine crisis began with Russia's invasion that that would begin to shift public attitudes in the West. And suddenly the language of fighting to defend borders, fighting to defend mm. your home, fighting to defend freedom and democracy, which had begun to sound like cliches after the Iraq war, would make inroads mm. in the West and that that shift would make the West more amenable to Israel because they would understand what it means to have to defend your home from yeah, an armed yeah. invasion. Are you, are you seeing that shift or was that well, wishful thinking? I mean, there was a poll that came out, Ipsos Mori, I think it was, straight after the invasion of Ukraine. I was in Ukraine last year and um, covered that conflict a bit. Um, there was a poll that came out of American public opinion shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, asking Americans how they, whether they would stay and fight or flee if their country was invaded like Ukraine was invaded. Mm. The figures were not that dissimilar to this. A majority of Republicans said that they would stay and fight. A minority of Democrats said they would. So it came out as about 51% of the American public said they'd How fight for America. This? Well, How? Because to us, it just seems so obvious that when you are under attack, you fight to defend your life. Well, you see, the first thing is, if you're an American, you can't foresee this scenario. Who's going to invade you? Canada? I mean, it, it's it's... It's a question so far, it's like saying, what will you do if people from the moon come? It's, it's, it's not in their experience. It's not even in their, in their um, memories. Uh, in Europe, it is in people's memories. But of course, one of the lessons that Europe took from the Second World War was just avoid war at all costs. Whereas there is one thing worse than war, and that's losing. And that's certainly a lesson that we've taken to heart in this war as well, where you know, we have the crowds around the world saying ceasefire, and obviously we would like the war to end too, but we need it to end in a way that makes sure Hamas cannot attack us again. Because if it ends yes. too early, then you just leave the enemy on its feet, threatening to attack you again and again. Of course. I mean, it's, it's intolerable. One of the things I've said about this country is it's absolutely intolerable this country should be in a position where it has to have a Gaza war every second or third year. No, it's and as if a, you've taken and it a as Lebanon, normal, And a Lebanon rockets. war every 15 to 20 years. If you look at what uh, Begin ha had to do in the 80s, what, what was Operation Free Galley? An attempt to stop the militia able to f from Lebanon firing missiles into people in the Galilee. It's exactly the same as 2006, exactly the same as now. So I think it's a totally un un uh, uh, unacceptable situation for any country to be in, to be having to have round after round of unwinnable wars. But just very quickly, if I can return to this point about the, the who would fight. You never really know until you get there. But you can lay the groundwork. The termites have gone very far, very fast in the West. What if do you you're mean a, termites? If you're a young American or British person and somebody comes along from a polling company and says, would you stay and fight for this country? Bear in mind, first of all, that this generation of young Americans have been taught that their country is institutionally racist, that it was founded by slaver racists, that it was founded in white supremacy, that all of it is rotten, that the founding documents were all rotten, that everything in American history is just suffused with racism and it's terrible. And then, by the way, would you mind giving up your life for this? That's not a good offer. Why would you? If the thing you're being asked to fight for is something you've been told all your life was rotten, why would you die for it? You only die for something if you care for it, if you love it, if you want to keep it going. The termites in the West are the people who have eaten away at the roots of the West. They've done it in Britain as well. 
They've tried to tell this generation of young Britons that they are from a country which, count them, did slavery, did colonialism, did white supremacy, did um, not enough minority stuff. I mean, are these like, charges false? Colonialism? I mean, well, it's all it's it's all based on falsehoods. Every, How so? Well, everyone in the world enslaved people, and by the way, the only people who still do are people in the Muslim world. But anyway, um, everybody in the world has slaves from time immemorial. Um, the oddity, the oddest thing was when the British government voted to abolish slavery. And not just to abolish it, but when King George III signed the Anti-Slavery Act into law in 1807, insisted that the Royal Navy get, um, get the, the, the Navy out across the oceans, not just to stop slaving within the British Empire, but around the world. Until 1880, Brazil was still slaving. It was stopped from doing so in part because young British men risked and gave their lives to stop the Brazilians taking slaves from Africa. So, there are several ways you can see the history of a society. I could, if I wanted to, by the way, and anyone could, if they were a malevolent actor, look at any country in the world through this same lens, and I could rip them apart in the same way if I was so malevolently inclined to do so. If I wanted to look at Turkey and to destroy and denigrate and demoralize the, the Turkish population, I could explain to them that they are the inheritors of an empire, a colonial power indeed, and a very brutal colonial power. My goodness, the Ottoman Empire makes the, the British Empire uh, look entirely pacifist. Um, the Ottoman Empire slaved, kept slaving much longer than everyone else. The Ottoman Empire brutally suppressed all minorities, chased one and a half million Greeks out of Asia Minor. Um, it was racist. It wasn't great with gays. Um, many, many things could be said about the Ottoman Empire. And you could use it to say to a modern day Turk, and that's why your country's rotten and you're rotten and you've got nothing worth defending. You can do that on everyone. As it happens, Britain and America have a much better history than most countries. Indeed, I think more than any country. But it's these countries that have been eaten away by these termite-like ideas that have been foisted on them. So the question is, firstly, would you fight for a country that you've been told is rotten? Obviously you wouldn't. Obviously you wouldn't. But the second thing is, if you still have the correct memory of your society, the correct appropriation of your society, the correct estimation of your society, and you're British or you're American, and you still have a memory from before the time when they tried to wipe it in the last 20 years. If you have that memory and a, and a proper estimation of your country's past and the fact that overwhelmingly countries like Britain and America have been overwhelming forces for good in the world, overwhelmingly forces for good. If you take that into account, then okay, you would wish to defend it and you'd wish to fight for it and maybe even die for it. But there's one other point I have to make. Never, never use these polls to predict the future. In 1934, the most famous vote that ever happened at our old university, the Oxford Union, was the king and country His debate. This house would not fight for king and country. Right. And everybody knows that that house of young men, entirely men at that time, of course, um, these young men voted in 1934 that they would not fight for king and country. And five years and later, every were, were single they? newspaper in Britain, the Telegraph, all of the press, attacked, lambasted this generation. They said that they're weak. Look, there was a good reason that those young men vo vo uh, voted that way that night. They were still traumatized. They were by the still great traumatized war. from the Great War. Many of them had lost their fathers and elder brothers and much more. You know, Europe did not want to go back to war. Britain did not want to go back to war. When Churchill spoke in the spring of 1940, he knew he was speaking to a nation that needed to be pushed into the point of courage he knew it was capable of. But the point is, is that those young men who voted that night at the Oxford Union, they would not fight for king and country. Six years later, signed up and they fought for king and country and they were the greatest generation. Well, that conversation with Douglas Murray was so fascinating, it ran to twice the allotted time. So instead of cutting it down to a short edited episode, 
we've decided to split it into two. If you are watching on YouTube, please click subscribe below to be notified when part two of my conversation with Douglas Murray comes out. We'll be discussing everything from democracy to dictatorship and everything in between. Thank you for joining us on State of the Nation.